Hey there, guys. It's Pete Mundo, and we are HeartlandCollegeSports.com. It's time to recap Week 5 in the Big 12. Thanks so much for joining us here on the show, whether it's Facebook Live, podcast, whatever it might be. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, giving us a few minutes of your time. As always, if you're getting this on the podcast, rating, review, subscribe helps us out a ton. Send me an email, screenshot of the rating and review to Pete Mundo at HeartlandCollegeSports.com. We'll get a free Heartland College Sports koozie in the mail for you. And um, also, we're brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Promo code BIG12, BIG12, for a 100% sign-up bonus on a minimum deposit of 45 bucks, maximum of 1000 That's MyBookie.ag. Promo code BIG12. You get uh, in-game betting. You can do it all there. I've been using them all season long. My picks have been terrible, but I've enjoyed it. So, we are going to go in order of these games, and uh, let's recap week five. Overall, eh. I mean, one game stole the show. You all know which game that was. We'll talk about that coming up. But it was a so-so week for the Big 12. Uh, the early games were, were, frankly, pretty painful to watch. Kansas, TCU, let's start there. Um, Sonny Cumbie, you think he was trying to prove something to Gary Patterson on Saturday? I mean, how evident was that, putting up 51 points, the last touchdown I did not love from TCU. That seemed very um, un-Gary Patterson to me. I think if someone had done that to him, he would have been none too pleased, to be totally fair and totally honest. Uh, I was a little bit surprised by that. But to Les Miles' credit, shook the guy's hand after the game. They seemed to have a nice embrace. There was no ill will there, no hard feelings. But, yeah, you had TCU punching in a touchdown to go uh, to win the game 51-14 when they could have easily taken a knee and run out the clock. That was a little bit surprising to me. But what you saw was Max Duggan getting more and more comfortable as time goes on. And that's why you stick with Max Duggan. Even when things aren't going well, like last week against SMU, Gary Patterson realized – that if he sits the kid for Alex Delton, he destroys his confidence of the guy that he wants to be his quarterback for the next two, three, four years in Fort Worth. That's something you can't do. So even last week when, uh, let's be honest, I was sitting there watching the game against SMU, and I'm like, do you go to Alex Delton? Because Max Duggan does not look comfortable in this game, in this spot. And then I realized you can't do it. I mean, this is, this is the, the risk you take with starting a true freshman, you have to stick with him through the lumps. You can't get rid of the guy and sit him on the bench because he has a couple of bad series in a row. You cannot do that because you're going to potentially hurt his future. So Patterson did the right thing last week. You didn't sit the kid. He comes out this week, and he looked really good. Um, you know, that first touchdown pass, a fade in the corner of the end zone, was a thing of beauty for Max Duggan. And those are the types of things that you expect to see plenty more of as time goes on from him. So uh, there, was, there was vast improvement from last week to this week. And this is exactly why, if you're Gary Patterson and Sonny Cumbie, you do not sit him and ruin his confidence. And it's just frustrating, though, because this TCU team, uh, the rankings will come out. They will not be in the top 25 again, um, as you would expect after the SMU loss. But – Man, this should be a top 25 team. I mean, they should be in the top 20 by now. If they beat SMU like they should have beaten SMU, if they win this Kansas game like they would have won this Kansas game, no matter what, uh, they'd be sitting there undefeated. They'd probably be in the top 20. And now you're most likely going to have a top 25 that comes out this afternoon that has just Oklahoma and Texas in it because of Kansas State's loss, which we'll talk about coming up. But And that just burns me because I really think that TCU can be the third best team in the Big 12 when all is said and done. And that SMU game, now SMU you know, looks to be a pretty good team, but that SMU game is still going to come back to haunt them at some point in this season. And I know that bothers uh, Gary Patterson deep down a heck of a lot. So any questions, comments on KU, TCU, throw them in there. We're on Periscope, Facebook Live. Of course, we'll have this up on the uh, podcast and on YouTube later today as well. But Kansas uh, looked like the old KU. It did not look like the team that went to BC and won. It did not look like the team that hung with West Virginia last week. Makes me wonder how, how uh, mediocre, to put it politely, this West Virginia team is going to be based on how that KU game went last week. I, I was, and I have not been high on West Virginia, 
but I have even more questions about them after seeing Kansas last week versus this week. But I feel like this was a perfect storm where TCU came in on a mission. This TCU team came in hungry, angry. Gary was pissed last week after that loss. He rolled Sonny Cumbie under the bus in some post-game press conferences saying, I'll find somebody to talk to you about the offense, um, explain what happened on that side of the ball. And it just seemed like Kansas came in feeling good about themselves, beat Boston College, hung in against West Virginia, and they got their clocks cleaned. And that's exactly what happened in this game for the, uh, for the Jayhawks. So I still think this team has improved. But, man, that was ugly. And now they've got OU coming to town uh, this weekend. So might be redefining the word ugly for Kansas after this TCU game. Speaking of OU, let's dive into the Sooners and uh, what happened on Saturday for them against Texas Tech with a big victory, what, 55-16. So uh, this game was, was interesting because obviously you did not have Alan Bowman. Now, I don't know how big of an impact that would have had. Maybe to lose by, I don't know, 30 instead of 40. I don't think it would have made a big difference. But as I'm, I'm watching OU, I'm watching Jalen Hurts, and we wrote about this on heartlandcollegesports.com, the fact that Jalen Hurts' numbers are awfully comparable to, uh, to what's going on with Baker Mayfield a couple of years ago and Kyler Murray last year. Both guys, of course, went on to win the Heisman Trophy. Jalen Hurts, I think, is going to be in New York. I don't know if he wins. A lot's got to be, you know, figured out between now and early December. I think he's going to be there, though, because he is putting up video game-like numbers. And what I wonder, I don't think Jalen Hurts is going to be the NFL quarterback that Kyler Murray um, appears to be and Baker Mayfield appears to be. They were both number one overall picks. There's no way in my mind Jalen Hurts is the number one overall pick. But I wonder if he's actually going to prove to be more explosive in this system than the other two because of his running abilities. Now, part of his ability to run is because he's not the passer that those two guys were, um, and he's got a different running style. He's more of a you know bruising running back than he is Kyler Murray, who is you know could turn the corner quick on his feet, really fast. That's not who Jalen Hurts is. He's a different type of runner, but you can use him almost like a running back from that standpoint. I mean, it just feels like OU, every time they touch the ball on offense, they're getting eight yards, at least. And I know those averages kind of work out, but it feels like, okay, they're getting eight yards. They're getting eight, nine, ten yards. Every single time, it just looks so easy when they're doing that. Um, and I wonder if Jalen Hurts can actually prove to provide an even more explosive offense because of his running ability which is something that, you know, Baker was not a runner. He was not a running quarterback. And Kyler, uh, people thought of him as a runner, but that's only by people on the outside who weren't really watching a lot of OU or Big 12. Uh, yes, he could run, but he was not a guy who, when his first read broke down, was running the ball. He would run the ball if he needed to or if it was drawn up for him, but it was not something that he looked to do when the play broke down. And that makes it, to me, completely different from a guy like Jalen Hurts. Uh, someone's breaking my chops on Facebook Live. I'll get to that here coming up about Baylor. So, OU, I mean, I'm just – I'm so darn impressed. The defense, by the way, the front seven is so aggressive. And I thought Joel Klatt was great yesterday pointing that out for the Sooners, uh, about the Sooners. What Alex Grinch is doing with that front seven is just being aggressive. Now, I understand – why, in hindsight, Mike Stoops did not want to be that aggressive with his front seven because he didn't trust his cornerbacks, right? Like, um, he just didn't trust his secondary a whole lot, and there were reasons to not trust that secondary. The secondary is a, is a little bit older. It's a year older. But what you're also seeing is you're seeing that the pressure the OU front seven is putting on opposing offenses is giving the secondary more opportunities to make plays. And it's causing more chaos for the opposing quarterback. Now, maybe Jet Duffy and Jackson Tyner are not the best examples to use, but they're the examples that we have right now. Um, and for Texas Tech, this quarterback situation is one they're going to have to figure out. I thought Jet Duffy, um, you know, kind of looked like I would expect him to look. Now, he actually was better throwing the ball than I've seen. He's improved as a passer. That touchdown that got pulled back, I think it was in the second half. Uh, beautiful fade to the left corner of the end zone. 
it got called off because of a holding penalty. But that's the kind of pass that Jeff D- Jet Duffy never had in his arsenal for Texas Tech. Um, if he can have a handful of those with his running ability, you know, he may be serviceable, but still, it's a huge drop off from Alan Bowman. A huge drop off. And, you know, this Tech team is going to struggle. It is going to struggle mightily to win games here moving forward because uh, the team, first off, the tackling of this Texas Tech team was horrendous yesterday. Uh, you know, I thought this Texas Tech defense had gotten a bit better, and I think it has. But, my goodness, they could not they could not tackle anybody to save their lives yesterday. It was pathetic. I have a picture up, or it's a video up on our Twitter page, at Heartland underscore CS, if you don't follow us on Twitter. It's a video from yesterday where I think it was, uh, was it CeeDee Lamb? I believe it was, catches a pass midfield. There's three Texas Tech defenders within, got to be two to three yards of the guy, and uh, he runs 50 yards for a touchdown. That looks like the Texas Tech defense from five, six years ago. I thought this unit was beyond that. I thought it was better than that. Um, and that's why, while I didn't think Tech would win this game, I thought they'd keep it mildly respectable because I thought the defense had come a long way. But I also don't know what was going on with the defense from the standpoint of uh, the, the, I guess, what the game plan was. Because it was weird. Like, I would see Jordan Brooks um, act as a spy on Jalen Hurts. So the ball would be snapped. You'd have three linemen rushing. You'd drop seven, and then you'd have Jordan Brooks standing there in the middle of the field. But then sometimes he would come on a delayed blitz. And at that point, why are you bothering? Either leave him as a spy, drop him in the coverage, or bring him on the, on the blitz. But the delayed blitz to me made no sense because then he runs into a lineman, which does nothing because a lineman for you are looking for somebody to block, and he's not trying to turn the corner on him. He's trying to run right through him. There were too many times when I was watching this game and I saw that happening uh, for Jordan Brooks or one of the other linebackers for Tech. And I'm like, what is the defensive game plan here? It's hard enough going up against the OU offense, but now it feels like you're kind of playing, you know, 11 on 10 in OU's favor, which is just a disaster waiting to happen. That linebacker would act as a spy for a, a couple of seconds. Then he would rush, but he wouldn't try to turn the corner on one of the tackles. He'd one run right into a, an offensive guard or a center. And I'm like, what's the point of this? It's kind of like you're in no man's land. He's not doing anything. Either bring him off the edge, drop him in the coverage, or use him as a spy. But like the quasi, whatever the heck was going on there for the Texas Tech defense, I did not understand for the life of me. Uh, The Eli Howard hit, let's touch on that. Eli Howard's cheap shot against Kennedy Brooks was a dirty play. Uh, It was cheap. Now, to the credit of Eli Howard, he apologized after the game. On Twitter, he, he put up something on social media. I give him credit for that. He apologized to Brooks. Uh, he apologized to Kirby Hoka, to Matt Wells. He deserves credit for that. Uh, I'll just read you quickly what he wrote on Twitter here. Eli Howard writing, My deepest apologies to Texas Tech coach Matt Wells, Kirby Hoka, for my illegal hit. It's a terrible look for Tech. Also, sorry to Kennedy Brooks. I hope there's no serious harm done. Well, Brooks came out of it unscathed, thank goodness. And, you know, I hope that that remains the case and he is okay. He's a guy who's dealt with injuries throughout his career. I would not want him to deal with any more. But, man, that was – it was dirty. It was cheap. It's up on heartlandcollegesports.com if you want to see it under Big 12 News. I'm glad that he apologized. It takes a big man to do that. But it also is like, dude, that doesn't take away from the fact that it was a dirty play. Uh, You went for the knees. From the side, I don't care about, oh, I thought the guy was out of bounds or I didn't realize the guy was out of bounds and the play is still going on. It's a cheap play. It's a dirty play. Uh, So kudos to Eli Howard for apologizing for it, but I don't think that takes away from the fact that it was dirty. It it still was dirty. Um, So there you have it, OU beating Texas Tech, single-handedly taking care of the early games here on Heartland College Sports Weekly. I'm Pete Mundo. Thanks for joining us, guys. We're brought to you by my bookie.ag use the promo code big 12 that's big one two for a 100 sign up bonus it's a good deal i'm um, i'm placing my bets there and if you've been following my picks you know i'm gonna have to redeposit soon because boy oh boy they have been terrible i tell you guys to fade the picks by the way 
trying to make you money. So I hope you did this week. You would have done pretty darn well once again. Uh, let's talk Baylor, Iowa State. First off, on Facebook Live, I got this from one of you guys. Eddie writes, is Baylor still 10th in your personal power rankings? Uh, no. No, they're not, Eddie. You know, that was a great win, um, great game, and no, Baylor is still not 10th. Baylor will be third for me because, uh, you know, they did roll through their non-conference, but I needed to see them play somebody decent. This was the worst non-conference schedule of any team in the Power Five, all right? So all you guys who were saying, well, I told you this was going to be, you know, how good Baylor was going to be. I knew Baylor would look like this. Well, you know, you're Monday morning quarterbacking, and that's great. You're allowed to do that if you're a fan of the team. But I'm trying to be as objective on each of these teams as I can be. I'm a Big 12 homer, but I am not a homer for any team in the Big 12. Some of you, of course, don't think that's the case, but that is true, and that is what I try to do every single week. I had no idea what Baylor was, and there was nothing they had shown me because of how bad the competition was to change my opinion on that. Um, doing what they did against UTSA and Stephen F. Austin and uh, Rice, I'm sorry. I can't judge anything from that. But yesterday was a great game and a great win, and they deserve an enormous amount of credit for that game. Now, they almost blew it, and I'll say this about you know this uh, Baylor-Iowa State game. For both teams, you can say the following. For both Baylor and Iowa State, you can say the following. You can say both teams deserve to win and both teams deserve to lose. Let's start with Baylor. You're up 20-0, and uh, you kind of took the foot off the pedal a little bit. Let's not kid ourselves. First off, you missed the extra point in the first half, which you knew was maybe going to come back to haunt them. And then the final touchdown drive for Iowa State, you have a couple of terrible, terrible um, defensive holding penalties. There's, a, there's the face mask, and, and it, was, it was really bad. And at that point, I'm like, you know what? Baylor deserves to lose this game. But then I'm also saying to myself, heck, Iowa State doesn't really deserve to win this game. So it's this double-edged sword where both teams you can argue deserve to win and both teams you can argue deserve to lose. That's how this game was. Um, let's start with Baylor, though. The defense is fast. The defense, based on yesterday, is, is underrated and underappreciated. And if this defense can just play that well the rest of the way, this team's going to win its 8-9, pushing 10 games, possibly. Uh, the defense has speed. It's got toughness to it that it has not had in the Matt Rule era. And uh, Rule deserves credit for that. I was surprised and impressed by the speed of this defense and the ability of this defense. But a lot of that also was because of an Iowa State offensive line that is going to prove to be its Achilles heel all season long. Those two penalties from Bryce Meeker, uh, uh, holding penalties, I believe they were on the offensive line, were terrible. I mean, that guy, I think he's a fifth-year senior. If not, I know he's a returning starter. He should know better. Uh, this, this offensive line does not need to be shooting itself in the foot. It has done that enough. And I think this is starting to affect Brock Purdy because, you know, Brock Purdy, it feels to me like he's looking for pressure. I mean, he, he, he drops back. He knows he's got a couple of seconds. And if he doesn't get the ball out, you know, someone's coming for him. He's, he's doing things like underthrowing. He's um, looking to run. He's, I think, feeling pressure, even though it may not be there yet. And I think it's throwing off Brock Purdy's game. Now, he looked better in the second half, of course, as they scored 21 unanswered. But um, this offensive line, which I admittedly thought before the season was going to be the best offensive line Matt Campbell had. Now, that's not saying much because the offensive line has not been great his first couple of years, but I thought it was going to be his best offensive line because of uh, the guys returning and there was experience back on that line. This line is struggling. There's no other way to put it. This line is struggling. And it's only going to get worse. So I think Baylor's got a good front seven. I don't think it's a great front seven. I think it's a good one. But wait till you get to, you know, the Oklahomas and Texases of the world if you're Iowa State. Uh, and that is, that is wildly concerning. Now, the people on social media calling for Rayal Mitchell, quarterback, I mean, get your head out of your end, uh, please. You've got Brock Purdy back there. And it's not Brock Purdy's fault that, that literally the guy has two seconds to get rid of the ball or he's going to be sacked or he's going to be running for his life. 
I, I still worry with the amount that he's running. I don't know what percentage are drawn up runs versus I better get the heck out of here runs, but it concerns me. I'm afraid that he's, you know, one hit away and he's running up the middle between the tackles, one hit away from an injury. I got to protect Brock Purdy better if I'm Matt Campbell, whether it's using those tight ends and, in, in, uh, you know, in blocking coverage, whatever it might be, but boy, it's concerning. Also what you saw was Iowa State is getting exposed at cornerback. Um, you know, they lost both starting cornerbacks from last year, and that has become evidence. DeAndre Payne's not walking back through that door. And uh, Charlie Brewer and a group of great Baylor wide receivers exploited that. I mean, they, they exploited that, and they did a really good job exploiting that. And you better believe other big football teams are going to exploit that. I think Iowa State has a fantastic front seven, arguably the best in the Big 12. But – uh, the cornerbacks are left on an island sometimes, and they're getting exposed, and that's only going to get worse. Or, you know, at least it's going to get worse against teams like OU and some others in the conference. So that's something that uh, Matt Campbell's got to work on. He, he's got to have those cornerbacks grow up and grow up quickly because there are, are legitimate concerns here um, for, this, for this Iowa State team at that position. So the offensive line and the cornerbacks for Iowa State uh, really do concern me. And in this game in general, that Baylor ends up winning, the ball just seemed to bounce the Bears' way a couple of times. You had the muff punt that bounced, and, and luckily Baylor was able to pick it right back up. And even when the Charlie Brewer had that strip fumble, you know, it, it bounces right back into his hands. And sometimes those are signs that it's just kind of that team's day, and that's how it felt like. Um, even once Iowa State went up, I just I said to myself, it just it feels like it's Baylor's day. Um, and that's how that whole game fell. Let's talk about the drama here uh, briefly involving the sideline temperatures. So if you missed this, uh, Baylor obviously hangs out on the side of the field that, that becomes shady first, right? And it was 92 degrees down in Waco yesterday. Then they have Iowa State, the away team, on the side where it's sunny all day. You know, it's kind of basic home field advantage. Now, yesterday it was 104 degrees on Baylor's side of the field. 145 degrees in Iowa State's side of the field. Iowa State was not allowed to have tents up, which it put up before the game because the Big 12, I guess, it wasn't approved early in the week or something like that, and Baylor may have complained about this. I think there's still a lot of poor reporting going on around this. I don't know what exactly happened, what didn't happen. I don't want to rip on Baylor and say, you know, they absolutely should have allowed those tents. I don't know if it was the Big 12's call, the Baylor's call, whatever it might have been. I still think there are unanswered questions here. But I'll say this. In a game like this, when the on-field temperature on one team's side is 145 degrees, whether it's the Big 12 or the home team, they cannot say you cannot have tensa. None of this, oh, you didn't get it approved by Tuesday at 3 p.m. BS. All right? None of that. Just like you're allowed to bring jackets up to Ames, when it's 15 degrees on a Saturday night, you should be able to have your tents on the field when it's 140 degrees. Like, do you need to get it approved to bring a bunch of coats and heaters to an away game up in Ames or Manhattan in late November? No. So why do you have to get approved to bring down tents when it's 140 degrees? Like, well, why is that? What is that all about? I don't understand it. I don't know if this is a Big 12 rule. I'll try to figure it out here in the next couple of days, uh, whether it's a home team rule. But there's no way you can tell a team that it cannot have tents to keep its guys cool when it's 145 degrees on their side of the field. That is ridiculous. I mean, we talk about heat stroke all the time now for these football players. It's like you got these guys on one side of the field, it's 145. Now, I don't know what effect that had on the game. In fact, you could argue it didn't have any. Iowa State looked better in the second half as the game wore on, despite the fact that they're on the side of the field that's 145 degrees. So I don't think that, you know, entirely explains what happened in the game. I'm just saying it should be very easy to fix going forward. Just like you bring coats and heaters, you can bring tents and coolers, and that's it. No questions asked. Everybody's on the same page. But, of course, the Big 12 has to overcomplicate things sometimes. Uh, leave us your comments on Facebook Live, Periscope. I'll we'll try to go to a couple here as we go along. Let's move on to Oklahoma State, Kansas State. 
Chubba Hubbard for Heisman. Are we starting that campaign yet? Should we be starting that campaign? He's got 200 and something more yards than anybody else in uh, the Power Five. So I don't know why it wouldn't be underway by now. But, man, this guy's a stud. He's the best running back in the Big 12. Don't tell me, oh, the OU running backs are splitting reps. Could you imagine Chubba Hubbard in Norman behind that offensive line? Uh, are you kidding me? Don't even try to compare one of the OU running backs to Chubba Hubbard because it's not close. I'm sorry, it's not close. And that's not to say Trey Sermon, Kennedy Brooks aren't great backs. They are. Chubba Hubbard's a difference maker, man. And this guy, when he is piling through several Kansas State uh, defensive linemen and linebackers in the fourth quarter last night, and he is churning and burning those legs into the end zone, I'm watching this guy and I'm saying, holy crap. It was unbelievable. 290-something yards last night for Oklahoma State and their win over Kansas State. And just so darn impressive. Now, um, if you're Oklahoma State, you got some concerns once you get in the red zone. Too many field goals in this game, four of them last night when you get inside the red zone. I think there's a couple things going on here uh, for Oklahoma State on that front. First off, uh, as you watch this team in the red zone, Spencer Sanders is not the pinpoint pans, uh, passer on fade routes that Mason Rudolph was and even Corndog was. Uh, last year he's still got to develop that that part of his game so Mike Gundy loves that play when he's in the red zone he does not have the quarterback yet to execute that play now against Kansas State it's okay you go up you kick field goals against Kansas State you'll be all right you can't do it against OU Uh, you know you can't do it against Texas it's going to be tough to do that against the better teams in the conference you can get away with it against Kansas State so the red zone's a bit concerning right now for Oklahoma State but they get this win. The defense started to, started to pick, some, pick up some steam. There was a stretch here that went into the game last night where it was 16 straight drives for Oklahoma State dating back to the Texas game where Oklahoma State's defense allowed a total of six points. That's a great number, and that is darn impressive for this team in this game uh, against Kansas State. Now, Kansas State, what do we learn about them? A couple of things for the Wildcats. They can't come from behind. Kansas State is not a team that is ever going to come from behind. Now, that's been true for most of the program's history, but they want to run the ball. They want to churn and burn, and they cannot do that when they're down double digits. They're not capable of doing it. Oklahoma State's defense um, held the running game in check, and the running game for Oklahoma or for Kansas State sets up the passing game, right? It's not the other way around. They had averaged 280 yards per game on the ground up until last night when they had, I think, a buck 26. So it was a, a, a tale of, of, you know, two games in that perspective where Kansas State couldn't get its run game going. That had been its bread and butter. Oklahoma State, with Chubba Hubbard, owned the running game last night in Stillwater. So uh, Kansas State knows that it is a team that cannot come from behind, at least not by 10, 14 points. And also they've got a major deficiency at wide receiver. Because when you're down double digits, you know, it, it, when Dalton Schoen's your top wide out, that's a problem. Dalton Schoen's a nice wide receiver. He's not a guy that's going to be a game breaker for you. It's just, just not who he is. He's not CeeDee Lamb. He's not uh, Denzel Mims. Uh, he's not Tylen Wallace. He's not one of those guys. So Kansas State coming from behind is not going to work out well. It's not going to happen many times for this team. So that's, a, that's definitely a concern for, uh, for Kansas State moving forward. And uh, we'll see exactly what Chris Kleiman has in play for that. Jared writes on Facebook Live, Pete Chubber should be the front runner for the uh, Doak Walker Award and should be getting some Heisman consideration. I totally agree. He's getting overlooked. I think that will change after this weekend. I've started to see some love from guys like Joel Platt on Twitter about Chubb Auburn, and that should absolutely be the case. Jimmy writes, K-State is not a juggernaut of an offense, so Oklahoma State's defense is still a big question. It'll be very hard for Oklahoma State to win a lot of Big 12 games, only scoring 26 points, especially in Lubbock. Well, hang on. Uh, first off, I don't know where the Lubbock comment comes from. Uh, Texas, Texas is disaster right now. Uh, I, I mean, are we really going to talk about not winning a game in Lubbock? How are we going to get to that point? Uh, let me see what the Oklahoma State schedule is coming up. So they're in Lubbock on Saturday, and then it's home to Baylor, at Iowa State, and then home to TCU. That's a really interesting stretch for for Oklahoma State because 
<laughs> Someone writes on Periscope, after listening to you on the podcast, your voice doesn't fit your face. I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. I'll take it as a compliment for now. But um, Oklahoma State basically has a stretch here where they're playing teams in the Big 12 that they're going to be trying to finish in third place or second place against. I say third because they already lost to Texas. Baylor, Iowa State, TCU, and Oklahoma State are kind of in that tier two of trying to figure out what the order is going to be. So for Oklahoma State, uh, the defense certainly looks better playing against a mediocre Kansas State offense, but still, they look good against K-State and then also in the second half at points of that Texas game. So hopefully Jim Knowles is starting to figure some things out on that side of the ball for the, uh, for the Cowboys, and, and let's see what happens going forward. I'm Pete Mundo. We are Heartland College Sports Weekly, part of heartlandcollegesports.com. Appreciate you joining us here as we recap week five in the conference. Great to have some of your questions and comments in the conversation as well. A reminder, we're brought to you by mybookie.ag, promo code BIG12, BIG12, for a 100% sign-up bonus. I uh, love those guys. They're helping us out, and, um, you know, we're helping them out as well, dropping a lot of, uh, a lot of people their way. And I'm going to be using them plenty more, even though they, my picks are terrible. I'm going to keep doing it. And as always, if you're listening on the podcast, please leave us a rating, review, subscribe. If you send us a screenshot of that rating and review, I will send you a free koozie. Heartland College Sports Koozie. I'm the only one that has them. You can't buy them anymore. Just send me a screenshot of the rating and review to Pete Mundo. That's M-U-N-D-O at heartlandcollegesports.com, and I will get the koozie in the mail for you. I will be in Ames next weekend for the TCU game. So if you're an Iowa State fan or a TCU fan, you're going to be there um, on Saturday, let me know. I'll write up a post about, you know, what we have planned for Saturday. We're going to do a little tailgate with guys that uh, – uh, wide right Natty Light are going to join us there as well, and also um, our friends over uh, at Frogs of War are going to be there as well. So looking forward to that a little three-way tailgate with those folks. Going to be a great time. Let me know if you'll be there. Find us on Twitter at Heartland underscore CS, and also on Facebook. Like us there. Just search Heartland College Sports. Also on Instagram. All right, guys, have a great week. We've got plenty of content coming on the podcast midweek. Check us out there. I'm Pete Mundo. Enjoy your Sunday. Enjoy the rest of the week, and we'll talk to you soon. Take care, guys.